Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name is May. I'm a media producer of Be A Hero. Um, and today we wanted to revisit the Supreme Court's decision from last week um, and right when challenges to the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare, were struck down in a 7-2 ruling. Um, this move by the Supreme Court is not only huge for folks who stood to lose their health insurance coverage, but it's also super meaningful um, in the work that we do and as we move forward and continue to fight to reshape what healthcare looks like in this country. Um, so to talk a little bit more in depth about this, we have two incredible Be A Hero team members and healthcare experts, um, both of whom know far more um, about this case than I do. Um, they include Matthew Cortland um, and uh, Laura Packard. Uh, Matt is a fearless disability rights activist and an amazing attorney. Um, he also serves as Be A Hero's policy director and is our go-to person for anything really politically confusing. <laughs> Um, Laura is not only, um, well, not only has her own incredible healthcare story, but she is also a super powerful um, healthcare uh, activist and digital strategist in the democratic political arena. Um, she has even had the honor of being blocked by Donald Trump. <laughs> so I'm gonna turn this over to them in just a second, but um, while we have this conversation, please feel free to drop in your questions for Matt and Laura in the chat, and we'll have a minute or two on towards the end of the discussion to answer any relevant questions. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Matt. Thank you for joining us both. Thank you. Thanks for kicking us off. If you hear meowing, it's because the cats that we're cat sitting for are locked behind the doors and they are not a fan. Doesn't mean that they're not gonna attack the computer as we're doing this. So. There was yet another Supreme Court decision on the Affordable Care Act. This is, this is a, the third major Affordable Care Act decision, uh, sort of right-wing Republican, red states, uh, uh, businesses, the, the Chamber of Commerce, which is a confusingly named non-official, non-governmental sort of trade group for big business. They've all tried to, to take a, a sledgehammer to the ACA before the courts. And now they're, uh, they've, they've struck out again. Um, the Affordable Care Act was upheld by the United States Supreme Court in a case called California v. Texas. And I wanna tell you briefly about why this matters, right? So red states led by Texas uh, in collaboration with Trump's Department of Justice and some sort of right-wing healthcare activists, heavy air quotes, heavy sarcasm, filed a lawsuit in Texas why in Texas? Because there's this guy whose name, if you don't know and you care about healthcare, you should learn because he is a existential threat to those of us who rely on ongoing healthcare in order to stay alive in this country named Reed O'Connor, who is a, a district court judge in Texas, is a federal district court judge. And he has never really seen an uh, ACA theory about why the law is bad that he didn't like. So a couple of years ago, when red states, they, their states, they, they're all Republican states, and a few individual plaintiffs filed suit saying, look, the, we all know that, that in the, one of the last Supreme Court decisions to save the ACA, the Supreme Court reinterpreted what is called the individual mandate. That's the thing where you had to have health insurance if you could afford it. If you were too poor for health insurance to buy health insurance, you could, for example, like I relied on Medicaid for many years, you could get Medicaid coverage. Um, but if you did not, there was a, a penalty, a monetary penalty and the Supreme Court reinterpreted that. They called it a tax. And the, the chief justice said that the Congress has the power to tax. Congress can tax, and if there's the, a tax because you don't have health insurance, that's a perfectly constitutional thing to do. That was years ago. And during the Trump administration, what the Republicans tried to do is they, they actually succeeded in setting the amount of that tax to zero dollars in zero cents. So the individual mandate that says you must have health insurance if you can afford it, according to the federal government, and if you don't have it, you have to pay a, a penalty, got reinterpreted to you have to pay a tax. And then during the Trump years, the tax got set to zero dollars 
in zero sense. Why? Primarily so that they could go to court and make the following argument. You can't have a tax that's zero dollars in zero cents. That's unconstitutional. That was the argument. That is why Laura and me and our friends in little lobbyists and in in healthcare, everyone who relies on healthcare in this country, was up in the air about whether or not the protections that the ACA provides, which are are many, uh, because of the ACA. There is no annual limit on the amount of healthcare claims that you can generate. So what does that mean? Some years it costs 400, 500 K to keep me alive. And before the ACA, I had a health insurance plan that set the maximum amount they would pay to keep me alive in any given year at hundred thousand dollars. Over that, they weren't going to pay. I would die. Doesn't matter. Actually better for them. They'd never have to pay out another claim about me ever again. There was also a lifetime cap, a lifetime limit. Uh, so, you know, you're spending $99,000 a year in healthcare and you get to a million dollars. And for, for my old plan, that would have cut me off. So each individual plan could set their own limits, but they were allowed to impose a lifetime cap, an annual cap limit, whatever word you want to use so that you would run out of healthcare money. These are the sorts of protections, uh, also requiring that folks who have pre-existing conditions uh, are able to get insurance because in the old days, before the Affordable Care Act, we could not really get insurance. Um, if you didn't have a very large employer who offered health insurance, you were kind of out of luck. So that's the good that the ACA did. And Republicans succeeded during the Trump administration in setting that tax to zero dollars. And then they went to the court in Texas to this judge named Reed O'Connor and said, you can't have a tax at zero dollars. That doesn't make sense. Therefore, the entire law, the entire law, you've got to say it's unconstitutional. You can't just throw out that one little bit of it, that one teeny sound bit. You got to, you, you can't just, you got to get rid of the entire thing. And, and, and um, Reed O'Connor said, yeah, yeah, we're going to strike down the entire thing. Strike it down. And then that was appealed to a court of appeals. And the court of appeals said, you know what, we, we actually pretty much in agreement with the district court's analysis, but we want them to take another look at whether or not the entire law, that's it's a big law, a lot of pages. And you know, his, he, he didn't do the homework right. It's not, didn't go into enough, enough depth. Really want him to take another look at it. That was appealed to the Supreme Court. And last week, the Supreme Court gave their decision. And they said that the red states, those states led by Texas and those individual plaintiffs didn't have what's called standing to sue. What is standing? Standing is a fancy way of saying that you have the legal right to bring a lawsuit in court. Why didn't they have standing? Well, they're not really harmed. That's, that's what this decision says. It says that setting the individual mandates tax to zero dollars and zero cents doesn't actually harm the states that brought suit. And it doesn't really harm the individuals that brought suit. And one of the sort of fundamental bedrock precepts and principles of American law at the federal level is that in a case like this, you need to have been harmed in order to bring a lawsuit. And these plaintiffs the court, the Supreme Court, uh, Justice Breyer, writing for the court, said that these, these plaintiffs didn't demonstrate that they were harmed because they're not actually harmed. And so they didn't even have standing to bring the suit, which is really another way of saying that this suit should never have made it out of Texas, right? That this is really a way of telling the district court one of the things that this means is the district court should have thrown out this lawsuit when it first was filed, and that didn't happen. And instead, all of us have had to live with the fear, the uncertainty, the doubt, the existential threat to our lives of having this lawsuit out there. Um, it did not, it did not, the court did not what lawyers would call reach the question. It didn't get to deciding whether or not the individual mandate tax can be zero dollars and zero cents. Like, is that constitutional? And the Supreme Court didn't get there. They said, 
We're not even going to bother getting to that question because the people who have asked us to decide that question, to make that determination, they actually don't have the right to be in court. They don't have the right to ask us for that decision. So that's where we are. The Supreme Court once again has upheld the Affordable Care Act. They did it in National Federation of Independent Business, which everyone's shorthands to NFIB versus Sebelius. They, they, they've done it in Burwell v. King. They, they, they keep doing this. So what does this mean? Um, these challenges around the individual mandate, I think, will be harder going forward. This should settle things pretty well, that if states don't have the right, don't have standing to sue, and if individual plaintiffs don't have the right and don't have standing to sue, it's really hard to imagine who would have standing to sue over the tax being zero dollars and zero cents. So this sort of line of attack seems fairly well shut down, foreclosed to me, um, which, which is good. I think the other thing that was interesting, we were all, the, the people who, who uh, watched this very obsessively, me, um, we were expecting I think the decision to come out on the last day that the Supreme Court issues decisions because they tend to hold their most controversial decisions for the last day. It's, you know, it's not a hard and fast rule. It's more of a heuristic. And we were expecting, I think, closer numbers. So this was decided. The other important thing here was that this was a seven to two decision. There are nine justices on the Supreme Court. Simple majority wins. Uh, so if you can have a five to four decision. This wasn't 5-4, it wasn't 6-3, it was, it was, this was 7-2, which is a pretty strong indication to the right to red states, to GOP political operatives, to the Heritage Foundation, to all of the people who are trying to destroy the ACA that, I, you know, they don't, they don't ever say this, but it's sort of a hint that the Supreme Court's kind of, t kind of sick of their, their, their shtick. 7-2, uh, to two, Seven to two. I want to be clear right now. The Supreme Court is six conservatives. We, we, we do not hold the court. But yeah, the decision was seven to two. So my hope is going forward, uh, the, these lawsuits won't make it out of the first stage, that they'll be dismissed early on for, because the plaintiffs lack standing, for example. There's now this whole new sort of analysis that they've got to run. Uh, judges, when, when plaintiffs file suit over the, uh, the ACA. So I think the ACA is more secure than it was certainly last week, two weeks ago. This is, you know, it's good news, this decision that I, I think it's very good news that they, they don't even have standing. They don't even have the right to sue. I think that helps secure the ACA. Um, and we can you know, work on all of the work that's left to do instead of, you know, the, the, the other, if they had struck down the ACA, that would have been an emergency that would have been very difficult to sort of react to in a meaningful way in real time and, and prevent people from being harmed by that decision. So that's roughly where we are. Does that make sense, Laura? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Matthew, for uh, explaining what just happened and what it means. Uh, my name is Laura Packard, and about four years ago, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer. Uh, and uh, the Affordable Care Act is what paid for the treatment I needed to be in remission today. And the timing all of all this was the spring of 2017. Uh, the first day after uh, my chemotherapy was the day that Republicans in the U.S. House voted to dismantle the Affordable Care Act. But as we all remember, uh, in 2017, they failed. They tried multiple times, but they failed. Uh, the most memorable vote was uh, uh, Senator John McCain voting thumbs down. And so when they could not succeed in repealing the ACA through Congress, instead, uh, they did a lot of chipping away of it behind the scenes. And as part of Trump's tax cuts at the end of 2017, they set the mandate to zero, which set this whole court case in motion. And in fact, I moved to Colorado at the beginning of 2019 because this court case was working its way through. Uh, and I knew 
knew that the Affordable Care Act was threatened and I'm uninsurable without it. So I have to do whatever it takes to keep my health insurance. Colorado was one of the states at the time that had uh, good state level protections for people with pre-existing conditions. So anyways, I moved to Colorado at the end of 2019, but we shouldn't have to live like this. We shouldn't have to move around in our own country just to be able to get affordable health care. And thankfully, with this decision, it's a little more secure. This is not the end of the attacks of, on the Affordable Care Act. In fact, there's already court cases uh, that threaten uh, the uh, uh, essential health benefits that are a part of the Affordable Care Act. And I wouldn't be too surprised if there are some lawyers in a bunker somewhere that are trying to come up with other ways to go after the, the ACA because they're not done. But we're not done either. <laughs> we're finally in a place where we can breathe for a little bit and we can look at making our healthcare system better. We can look at expanding Medicare so that it covers vision and dental uh, and hearing coverage. We can look at expanding Medicaid, especially in the uh, conservative states that have not uh, already expanded Medicaid to their poorest citizens. So there are 2.2 million Americans that can't afford health care and can't get health care just because they happen to live in Florida or Georgia or North Carolina. Uh, and so uh, they're talking about how to fix that right now in Congress. And so pay attention to the infrastructure bills that Congress is working on now, because uh, they may include uh, subsidies to make health insurance more affordable. They may include pieces to make prescription drugs cheaper. Uh, there are a whole bunch of different pieces that are being talked about in those bills. And your voice is needed so that your representative and your senators hear from you that health care is important and they need to vote to support it. So are there any questions from the audience? Matt, if if you can you explain a little bit about the other court cases? If you know, have you been following them? So there was a uh, the the follow on litigation. There were some copycat lawsuits over the individual mandate. Those will all go away. Um, there is this notion that what you, you, you talked about, the essential health benefits or EHBs. EHBs are the part of the Affordable Care Act that says what your insurance company actually has to cover. Because otherwise you can imagine a company like Cigna saying, yeah, you, you know, thanks for the thousand dollar premium a month and uh, really, really appreciate you paying that on time because if you're 30 seconds late, we're gonna kick you off. For your grand and premiums a month, we're giving you, we're covering one bottle of 250 milligram Tylenol, one bottle, that's it. That's the entirety of your health. You can imagine a company like, oh, I don't know, Cigna doing something like that. What they were doing before the ACA wasn't that comically evil, but it was close. It was close. They would do things like deny coverage for cancer treatments. They would do things like deny coverage for emergency department. The essential health benefits say, no, actually, if you're going to sell insurance and uh, you want to charge people for it, you actually have to provide them with health care coverage. So if you go to the emergency department, that has to be covered. If you go to the hospital and they say, you know what, Matt, you're in real trouble. Uh, we can't let you go home. We have to admit you. And then in the morning, the world's leading expert on what appears to be wrong with you is going to come by so that we can see if we can keep you alive. That's just a hypothetical from, oh, wait, my real life a few years ago. Uh, you stay overnight in the hospital. Insurance companies have to cover that. They have to cover inpatient treatment because it's an essential health benefit defined by the ACA. Now, you can understand why if you want to kill people, if you don't want to pay for health care coverage, if you uh, want your employees to die or whatever the case may be, you think EHBs are bad. Um, and so challenging the constitutionality of EHBs, I don't know. See, this is the tricky part. You never know how far these lawsuits are going to go. It's real hard to predict. Um, will it make it to the Supreme Court? I, I mean, the Supreme Court's three cases on one subject 
in this shorted period of time, and it's, I know it, it feels like forever for us, but for the Supreme Court, which moves in sort of glacial pace, it's, it's been breakneck speed for them. So will it make it to the Supreme Court? I don't know. Generally, with a law as important as the ACA, if major damage is going to be done to it, the Supreme Court wants their say. They want the last word. So I think it's real unlikely that, for example, they go to Reed O'Connor, Reed O'Connor says, oh, you can't tell insurance companies what to cover. And then they appeal to the appeals court and the appeals court says, oh, you can't tell insurance companies what to cover. And then nothing else happens. I think if that, if that chain of events were to unfold, we'd end up back at the Supreme Court. I just, I sort of wonder how tired all, all of the legal apparatus is of talking about the Affordable Care Act. Uh, that is probably the best thing in our favor right now. They, they're just, you know, they've kind of had enough. And in, in fact, in the decision that Justice Breyer wrote, he did get a little, uh, for Justice Breyer, it was a little snarky talking about our trilogy of ACA cases, sort of the worst kind of trilogy. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know what will happen there. Um, and then the other major area where they really like to litigate, and I, I think it, it's around, um, there have been challenges to things like the requirement to cover birth control, to cover contraception, to cover abortion. I think we're going to see a shift away from ACA specific challenges to just trying to make birth control unlawful or illegal or allow states to do that same thing with abortion. So I don't know what the future of ACA litigation looks like. Um, it also really depends on, as you were just saying, Congress is right now considering these next two weeks, they are figuring out the numbers of what they're going to do on health care. Are we going to expand Medicare? Are we going to make it stronger? Are we going to do subsidies for marketplace plans? Are we going to pay for that by forcing drug companies to stop price gouging? One of my medications is $11,000 a month, and I'm like, this this. I, I would like my mansion, please. It's just absurd. Um, should they be allowed to do that, you know, a new round if that drug pricing litigation, if the drug pricing uh, makes it into the bill, you know, forcing pharma to lower drug prices. They're not going to go quietly on that. They're going to do everything they can. They're going to sue. They're going to stomp their feet. They're going to tell us, uh, you know, how how grateful we should be that there are our heads and saying your money or your life. Um, so, you know, the future is a little murky, but it's a lot better than it was. And it would have been if, if Donald Trump were reelected, for example, in which case it was trying to figure out how we were going to survive. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. So it's tentatively good news. Uh, but just to be real here, if control of the house and the Senate, flipped and we had a different president this this isn't done forever right like they they could try to repeal the affordable care act through congress again there's nothing stopping them from that right absolutely correct um past congresses can't bind future congresses so it's not like you can put in no take backs in the preamble to a bill um, so, you know, uh, there, there are, because so many of our fellow Americans think that you and I should both be dead. They think that people who get sick deserve to be sick. They think that people who get sick deserve to be sick and therefore they shouldn't have to pay for any of it because of all of that not a settled issue they're not going to give up uh you know eventually with a program like medicare very popular incredibly popular uh they've stopped trying to take it away from seniors but you know they're they're they fight doing things like including vision dental and hearing in medicare because they know that when you cover people when you give them health care it's real hard to take it away. And I think we're seeing the same thing in the ACA. We're starting to. ACA had a rough start, as you know. It, 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 it got off to a rough start. Implementation was real hard. It took people a long time, comparatively, to realize the benefits. But I think today, people understand 
that when their kid gets sick, they can take their kid to the doctor and get a diagnosis and not have to worry about slapping a pre-existing condition label on their kid that would make it difficult for them to get insurance for the rest of their life. I think people know now that you know, they've read the stories, they've seen, they've seen folks, they, they know, but, 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 but there are highly motivated folks funded by the Koch brothers. You were saying uh, lawyers in a bunker. Um, they're not bunkers. I, I went to one of the law schools. I went to the most conservative law school in the United States. They're very well appointed. The study carols are made out of mahogany because why not? The cappuccinos in the faculty lounge are delightful. Um, they're not roughing it in a bunker as they figure out what they're going to do next. And they are going to do something. They, they will continue to f find things to sue about. And it, in, I, my money would be on whatever improvements to the healthcare system Congress does as part of Build Back Better will be immediately attacked in court. But to your point, yeah, of course, if they flip the House, Senate, and, and they, they win the presidency, and, and let's be clear, that's their plan, right? They are trying to rig the system. They are trying to rig the deck. They are trying very hard in every state to rewrite the rules about who can vote. So it's mostly white, wealthy men and not black and brown folks who tend to vote against Republican corporate interests. You know, they, they are going through right now in disenfranchising voters roll back civil rights in this country uh, aided by the Supreme Court, which struck down the Voting Rights Act, key provisions of the Voting Rights Act. And so, you know, the other big, believe it or not, I think the biggest health care bill right now, People Act, it's S1, Senate Bill 1. It's about, because the thing is, when the American people vote, when they get a fair shake, when they're just allowed to vote, it turns out they like people having health care. They like having health care themselves. They like their spouse having health care. They like their kids having health care. They like their parents having health care. Health care is real popular. And the only way you can take it away from people and elect people and put people in Congress who want to take it away from us is by rigging the rules of the game. So one thing I would encourage you to do, particularly if you're watching this from West Virginia or Arizona, is reach out to your United States senators and tell them to support the For the People Act. That's my call to action, Laura. Yes. So uh, to wrap up, uh, it's cautious, we're cautiously optimistic. It's good news from the Supreme Court so far. The uh, They're certainly not done attacking our health care, but at least for now, this is a victory. And make sure you contact your representatives now about the infrastructure plans to make sure that all the pieces of healthcare that you care about are included. And make sure you contact your representatives in Congress and make sure they support uh, voting rights protections so that everybody gets a chance to be a healthcare voter. And with that, uh, thank you very much for listening. And uh, we're just so grateful to still be here and that the Affordable Care Act is here too.